Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Home Daily for May 18th, 2018. On today's show, we're going to dive into Deadpool 2 and have an all-spoiler episode talking about uh, our not just our feelings about the movie, but we're going to discuss all the, like, spoilery bits in that in that sequel. So uh, if you have not seen Deadpool 2, you might want to, uh, you know, pause this, come back later after you've seen it. Uh, this is Slash Home Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And writer Chris Evangelista. Hello. Okay, guys, uh, I know Chris has already talked about Deadpool 2. I've already talked about Deadpool 2. But Brad went last night to see the movie in, in, on opening night. What did you think, Brad? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say that I was disappointed, but... Um, something about the movie just didn't quite fully deliver for me. I thought it was very funny. There's a, a lot of great jokes in it, even though there are some duds and Deadpool's, you know, fourth wall breaking, wisecracking all the time shtick can be a little tiring as the movie goes on, uh, especially once we get around to the third act. But, you know, it's it's a very enjoyable sequel. I, um, and while it's competently made, better than the first movie as far as filmmaking quality is concerned because of director David Leach. It's, I don't think that it's quite as tight or as uh, pleasing as the first one, simply because I think some of the novelty has worn off of Deadpool. Like we get it now. We know what his character sticks about and it, he just, it, it overstays its welcome just a little bit. And so while I still enjoyed it, I found myself checking my phone every now and then to see what time it was and, you know, being getting a little exasperated every now and then. So I didn't didn't hate it. Was not fully disappointed, but just uh, wasn't in love with it. Brad, I I uh, am on the same wavelength as you, but I gotta publicly shame you for pulling out your phone during an, an actual movie on opening well, night. Let me let me be clear. When I when I check my phone time, my my <laughs> dim is all the way down, and I I hide it with my body so that I'm the only one who can see it. Yeah, I I also have done that from time to time. Um. Okay. Uh, oh, also at your screening was uh, did they play the the Happy Time Murders trailer? The the Red Band trailer. Yeah, it was attached to Deadpool two. It was the last one that played before the movie, uh, and it absolutely killed uh, with the crowd that I was in. They were laughing so hard, especially at the the end gag. Uh, people were laughing so damn hard. They were laughing right up through like the opening of Deadpool two. It was it, I was so surprised to see just how well received that trailer was yeah for people who don't know what this is it's brian henson jim henson's son directed this movie it's an r-rated comedy starring melissa mccarthy and uh it is set in a world an la like noir-ish world where uh there are puppets and humans living together and uh it's kind of like roger rabbit but with puppets but um very, very vulgar, and I mean, is that how you? How would you describe it, Brad? No, for sure. That's the, that, the best way to describe it. Is it's who framed Roger Rabbit with with extremely dirty, vulgar, nasty Muppets. Like yeah. there's there's prostitute Muppets. There's Muppets forcing people to do drugs. There's a very explicit uh, and hilarious sex scene in this trailer. With the, it, it is not anywhere near meant for kids. <laughs> Chris, did you see this trailer? No, uh, I haven't watched it yet. I don't like to laugh, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Uh, let's move on. I, I will actually, before we move on, I just want to say it, it was hilarious. I saw a early version of this trailer at CinemaCon, which I talked about here on this podcast. Um, this trailer was a little bit cut down from that. Uh, the original trailer actually had a song from the Muppets in it, and uh, I guess they couldn't get permission. <laughs> For the, to have that in the actual trailer uh who knows why oh because it, it's an r-rated thing um but yeah if you haven't checked it out you can check it out on slash film.com i will link it in the show notes but let's move on to deadpool 2 uh again this is your second warning if you're still here and you have not seen deadpool 2 uh you know you're going to get spoiled because what we're about to start off with is a big spoiler in the film um the the movie is being promoted uh, with, well, two things, I think. Uh, the introduction of the of Cable, right? And the second thing is that Deadpool has to put together 
a team of superheroes to uh, help fight him. And that team is the X-Force. And that is how the trailers are built up. We see a lot of the X-Force in action. Uh, but there's kind of a twist there. Chris, can you can you talk us through it? Uh, yeah, so there's a it's a very funny uh, scene, although I, I have to add that this whole concept is stolen directly from Mac- McGruber, which is a better movie, but uh, it's still funny in this film, too, where almost immediately after assembling the X-Force, they all uh, die terribly, except for Domino. Uh, we, we watch them die one by one in increasingly horrific ways. And uh, over the co- of course of like a minute and a half, they like yeah, all perish. It- it's very quick, and uh, the, audi- I, uh, the audience I saw this with pretty much lost their minds at this sequence, and it's a very funny sequence, but um, uh, anyone who had you know seen trailers and stuff for Deadpool 2 will, will know that there's a lot of footage of the X-Force in action in those trailers, and almost none of that actually happens in the movie. And so uh, David Leach, the director, and uh, Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick they went on record talking about basically how everyone worked behind the scenes to to fool the audience through marketing. Um, uh, I won't read direct quotes because they're a bit lengthy. You can read them at SlashFilm.com. But basically, they brought a lot of the actors in and shot additional scenes just for the trailers. Uh, and a lot of them were shot in front of green screens. And you can sort of tell when you go back and look at some of the trailers that it, it's shot over a green screen. But they deliberately just shot this stuff as uh, a fake out to just fool audiences with trailers. And uh, they also talk about how they were considering making like character posters and uh, movie theater standees, but they sort of pulled back on that idea because they thought it was going too far. And they thought the audience would eventually get angry at them if they, they faked everyone out too much. Now, I mean, this does bring an interesting question because, you know, they're filming scenes just for the trailer, just to deceive the audience. Uh, but it is in the the service of, um, you know, keeping the audience surprised and protecting, you know, the the big spoiler of it all. Uh, it, at what point does it become malicious and deceptive? You know, like that, like they're selling a movie that doesn't actually exist. Brad, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I mean, it's that's kind of what the trademark is of comic book filmmaking nowadays there's a lot of this set up for movies that haven't been made yet so it's not necessarily out of the ordinary and i don't think it's it's bad if anything in this case i think it kind of helped deadpool 2 deliver something that was surprising and funny because i know that i was not expecting uh what happens in that movie for them all to just get killed in the span of a couple minutes uh you know it was it was a very funny situation it did make me feel like it kind of undercuts the existence of those characters, and in, in a way, it kind of mistreats them. But you know, I mean, Deadpool is all about irreverent comedy and doing things like that, so it it, it makes perfect sense. I I don't have a problem with it simply because X Force is just going to be more of the same. You know, even even the writers are saying that they kind of just want it to be like a raunchier version of X Men. You know, so yeah. if that's what if that's what they want to accomplish, then you know they're doing exactly what they're setting out to do. Chris, uh, do you personally have any problems with? Uh deceptive marketing practices like that i think it depends on on the movie because you know the the whole deadpool brand is about you know fucking with people basically so i think it works for this i think if this were like a more serious movie what about um, done... what about star wars rogue one that movie notoriously had a shot well actually had a lot of shots that weren't in the movie but that's you know because of reshoots and stuff but it had the shot of Jin urso walking down a ramp towards a tie fighter that was approaching and that shot was completely created for marketing purposes. Uh, you know, in the movie she's walking, but it's, it's actually, I don't even think it's the same take of her walking and she's not walking towards a tie fighter. Like is something like that, uh, more of a problem or. So, I mean, I had a lot of problems with rogue one to begin with, so it's hard to reconcile that, but it depends if it's like a quick shot like that, like a quick, cool moment i don't mind it so much but if it was like a big like a plot detail like if there was like a plot detail spelled out in a trailer for a serious film and that ended up not being in a film i might be a little bothered by it but it's really it's like a case-by-case basis i think i think i'm on the same page as you as long as it's uh not something that doesn't happen in the film that is like a big kind of like 
plot ish kind of detail. I think, uh, you know, if it's just like a cool action shot or something like that, or even what Deadpool did, I, I don't, I don't think I have a problem. I actually like that they did that. Um, I know a lot of people try to stay away from trailers and stuff, but I kind of love how, uh, you know, these big studios are actually producing trailers that kind of, uh, you know, even with Star Wars The Last Jedi, kind of like, you know, hint at one direction that doesn't happen or does, you know, it, it, like it's very cleverly edited uh, for someone that doesn't want to be spoiled from the trailer. And uh, I'm hoping that we see more of that. Uh, let's talk about, um, let's jump to the credit scene. Because there was there only one credit scene on this film on my press screening there was only a mid credit scene. Well, te- technically there's two because they they do they they interrupt the credits and they do a scene and then it goes back to credits for a bit and then it comes back and it shows the follow up to what that scene set up. Okay, Brad, why don't you walk us through it? What happens in the mid credit scenes? Yeah, so the very first credit scene, uh, there the Deadpool is back at the X Mansion uh, with Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Um, and, uh, Yuki, is that her name, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, who, who so, by the way, she's like, like the biggest, like caricature of a racist, uh, ca- character. Like, is, is that the purpose of her in this movie? That, I mean, I don't he, think that, that she... Deadpool's kind of calling the other guy a racist and then he's like kind of loving on the, the, the caricature of kind of like that, you know, what, I like mean, a I, Japanese schoolgirl really, kind of thing? I don't think that that's really a caricature because it's not as if that there aren't actual Asian women who do dress like that. And like that that's part of, I mean, Asian culture there is like there are there are people who do dress like that. Oh, so, well, I mean, I'm, not, not, I'm not talking about the dress. I'm talking about how like she's just like perky and uh, am I reading too much into this? Chris, is like, is the movie not that clever? <sighs> I don't think they were intending it to be that way, but I, I definitely could see that interpretation. I don't know if they like they sat down to definitely put that in there. I really don't know. Okay. Anyways, uh, Brad, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so, so they're back at the X Mansion. Deadpool's hanging out with Negasonic and Yuki, and Negasonic is working on fixing Cable's time travel device. As we learned at the end of the movie. Cable only had enough uh, fuel, whatever the fuel is, to give him enough e- uh, energy to time travel from the future. And then uh, he was supposed to time travel back, but he ended up using it to travel back in time to save Wade Wilson's life. So he can't travel in time anymore, but apparently Negasonic Teenage Warhead figured out how to fix it or to g- uh, replenish its fuel in order for it to work. And she gives it to Deadpool after she finishes it, and he just runs off and Negasonic basically says she goes, she goes, Oh my God, what have I done? Uh, immediately regretting helping Deadpool do whatever he wants to do with the time travel device. And, and then it co- goes away and it almost makes you think that maybe it's some kind of setup for what they're going to do with a sequel or just a gag, like, you know, letting people run away with their imagination is what the hell could somebody like Deadpool do if he can time travel. Uh, and then we find out because the second mid credit scene comes back and it shows Deadpool on a, a gauntlet run of time traveling through various scenes. The very first one is him uh, time traveling to save his girlfriend Vanessa from being killed, which was is the big inciting incident that kind of sets off the uh, a bigger character arc for Wade Wilson. Um, and so that's an interesting one because it feels like it could have larger ramifications for the rest of the Deadpool franchise and even X-Force because if he's saving her life, then it kind of undoes his whole character arc but as we saw with how time travel works at the end of deadpool 2 it's that back to the future thing where there's an instant change in the future or in you know in the past however you want to see it so maybe by saving vanessa he doesn't necessarily undo everything that happened in deadpool 2 but just the things related to her because I, it's likely that de- the events of deadpool 2 involving cable would still have happened whether or not vanessa was alive i guess it's just a matter of his maybe emotional growth maybe uh disappearing even though that deadpool that did travel back in time still learned those lessons and then we get a time travel paradox stuff and it's just like yeah <laughs> wait, wait wait but before you go on i wanted to bring up you know i love this end credit sequence like during it i was laughing out loud uh it is hilarious but then afterwards i was kind of thinking about this and you know the ramifications it could have doesn't it kind of like discount the entire movie that we just watched and that emotional 
arc that Ryan Reynolds character uh, went through, like basically him saving her. And doesn't that just, uh, I don't know. It feels like it to me afterwards, but while I was walking out of the theater, I felt like it kind of like discounts the whole arc that we saw in the movie. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I was talking about too. But, and that's why I brought up the idea of that, you know, maybe that, Deadpool still learns those lessons because he lived through that and that version of Deadpool still exists. I don't know how it works as far as if maybe there's alternate timelines now because the X-Men timeline is already pretty well fucked up and confusing well, anyway. I'm not even talking about timeline wise. I'm just talking about from a storytelling oh, perspective. No, no, no. Well, for sure. And that, but that's but even like but that's what I'm saying though is like if taking taking time travel into consideration, the Wade Wilson that went back in time to stop her from being killed already learned those lessons and he'll oh okay i see what you're saying and he'll continue to exist even after he leaves that situation so if anything it might just change his mindset a little bit so that maybe he'll like it'll be a combination of him living through both those experiences i i don't know that's it's it's very confusing because of how time travel (laughs) you know works chris were you bothered by them kind of you know correcting the entire inciting incident for this movie in the credits (laughs) Not really, um, because, you know, again, that's sort of like uh, the Deadpool ammo where it's all about just screwing with the audience. And it actually it's bothered me. It's all about the jokes. It doesn't really matter. Yes. Yeah. But, and it also bothered me a little that to, they, to use the, the Internet term, they fridged his girlfriend so quickly and killed her. And that kind of pissed me off a little because it, I, I was hoping they wouldn't go that route. So the fact that they just literally undid it made that like – uh, I, ju- I just think it's it's lazy writing when you have your hero be motivated by, you know, oh, his girlfriend or his wife was murdered. I, I just still feel like in this day and age, that's really lazy. And I, I like that the film was smart enough to say, like, all right, let's just go back and undo this. Yeah. OK, Brad, what what, what is the rest of the end credit scene? Yeah. So then uh, the next time travel jump that he makes is to the moment when all of the members of X-Force were killed in their tragic skydiving incident. Um, but the only one that Deadpool takes the time to save is everyone's surprising fan favorite edition, which is Peter W., the character played by Rob Delaney, who apparently has zero superpowers and is just this bumbling mustache <laughs> dad of a character. And he dies and, in the most spectacular, funny way. Yeah, so it, rather than getting spit on by the acid of Zeitgeist, uh, Deadpool just tells him, hey, step back. He's like, okay, you're, like, you're good. And, like, you know, saves him and then just tells him to just go basically fuck off and, you know, don't worry about it. So uh, that presumably means Peter will be back in a future installment, whether that's X-Force or Deadpool 3, whatever. He survives and will, will probably come back in some capacity. Uh, not clear whether or not the rest of X-Force will be <laughs> among those team members, but probably not. Um, and then after that, the next two sequences aren't really impacting the story of Deadpool so much, but they're just kind of little moments for fans to love and laugh about because uh, Deadpool goes back to X-Men Origins Wolverine when uh, Hugh Jackman is about to face off with the modified Wade Wilson who has his mouth sewn shut and has blades for arms and laser eyes and a bunch of other dumb bullshit that ruined Deadpool. Which was and played Deadpool- by Ryan Reynolds. Well, yes, he was. Uh, it's where the, the whole you know Deadpool thing started, and uh, there's no new footage of Hugh Jackman. It's just recycled footage from X Men Origins. But Deadpool comes in and just shoots Wade Wilson straight in the head, uh, mouths off a couple lines, and then shoots him a bunch more times as his dead body lies on the floor. Uh, so that's a great redemption for uh, Deadpool after being introduced in such a shitty way in back in 2009 wait and then after I, that, I have a question for you didn't hugh jackman say he wasn't going to going to be in this movie well i mean he's not wrong he didn't shoot anything <laughs> for this movie <laughs> <laughs> so it was okay to lie because he technically did not film anything be, new well to be fair maybe he didn't even know that they were going to do that oh i mean well I, I would think his people would have to give the rights but i mean that, that's fox's decision it's their movie it's their footage yeah yeah uh so then the final one is uh, a little bit of a jab that Ryan Reynolds takes at himself because uh, then we go back to a time when Ryan Reynolds picks up the script for Green Lantern and he's really excited about it. I think he says something like, welcome to the big time, baby. And then all of a sudden, Ryan Reynolds just gets shot in the head from behind uh, by Deadpool. So Deadpool kills Ryan Reynolds. And you would think that that would you know, mean that Deadpool wouldn't happen. But, you know, we're we're not dealing with real logic here at this point. We're just dealing with jokes. Yeah. Uh 
how many jokes do you think were at the expense of the uh, uh, uh like the DC EU in this movie? There was a ton, right? No, I mean, there's not really a ton. There's a few. There's the the Batman vs Superman Martha line. There's the "You're so darky" from the DC universe. Um, and then there's there's one joke that's not even a jab at DC. It's just Ryan Reynolds saying that he's Batman. Um, yeah. So there, there's a there's a couple, but they they definitely didn't like you know try to kick them while they're down or anything like that. Okay, I got a, I got a question to propose to you guys. Uh, you know, since Peter has been saved. Should he come back in the next movie, whatever, either that being Deadpool 3 or X-Force, uh, and should he be actually part of the team? Should he be like Kenny in South Park where he, you know, returns and dies every episode? Chris, do you have any thoughts? I mean, I'd like to see him back just because uh, I thought the character was funny, but, you know, if they don't bring him back, I'm not going to be upset or anything like that. Maybe they could replace uh, T.J. Miller's character with him. In the bar. That's a good idea. Yeah, they actually should do that. So listen up, Hollywood. <laughs> Brad, should Peter return? Oh yeah, I'm totally down to see Rob Delaney come back and and screw around with Ryan Reynolds. That, just, he's just a fun, goofy character. It's like watching you know one of your friend's dads you know hang around with a superhero for a little while and he doesn't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> okay, and the other question I want to propose is: I know we've talked about on this podcast before the idea that the Marvel in credit scenes are not really canon i mean we we have not been told this by uh kevin feige you know i i'm sure he probably considers some canon but i chris i think you were one of the people that proposed this idea that you don't really consider them to be canon so i'm wondering i know this isn't a marvel studios film but a lot happens in this end credit scene like that really reverses a lot of big things you know in this universe like is is a canon or is it just a joke I feel like with this, it, it sort of has to be Ken just because, like you said, a lot happens. But at the same time, if you were to like walk out of the theater and not catch any of this stuff, like you left right as the movie ended, like you wouldn't know the film had pretty much undone <laughs> everything that came before. So I don't know. It, it's kind of it's like a weird it's a weird thing because most post credit scenes don't operate like this where they're literally about the character undoing everything that happened already so it's it's hard to gauge really and by the way my critic screening which i'm not sure if it was filled with critics or half audience I, i'm not sure i recognize a lot of the people there i would say before the end credit scene started about half of the audience emptied out of the the, the theater and i'm like don't people realize by now that these marvel movies you got to stick until the end I mean, it, it just seems ridiculous. Uh, Brad, uh, is this canon? Like, does it, like, in the next movie, will uh, Wade's uh, girlfriend be alive? I mean, I hope so, simply because uh, I like uh, Marina Baccarin in, in this role, and I think it would be cool to, ha- to have her back. And like Chris said, too, it, it does seem like a cheap shot to just kill her just for, to, for the sake of giving, you know, Ryan uh, Wade Wilson a, a character arc. Um, you know, she's, she could easily be fleshed out. There's a lot that they could still do with this char- that, that character, especially, you know, if, uh, Russell kind of becomes this adoptive son of Deadpool. And so I, I think that there's some potential there that they can do more with their character. So I hope that it ends up being a canon thing and it wasn't just a, a gag for the credits. Uh, can we talk really briefly about some post credit scenes that were written and nearly included in the movie? but uh, did not make the final cut. Uh, ben wrote this up for the site, but uh, Brad, what do we know? Yeah, so uh, as we talked about, there's plenty of uh, gags that are in the credits, but there were some that did not make the cut. Uh, one of them is uh, quite ridiculous and probably would have been a little too much. The other one would have been fantastic to see happen if it actually got to the point where they were trying to make it a reality. Uh, so the first one is really just one that's just a goof, and it's something that's actually kind of referenced in the movie itself. Uh, Deadpool chastises uh, Cable and asks him, he's like, why are you coming back in time to this period to kill Russell now? Why don't you just go back when he's a baby and do it? Or is it better yet, why don't you just go back in time and kill baby Hitler and do, do something about that? And so uh, the credit scene in question would have had Deadpool going back in time and killing a baby Hitler. Apparently they, they actually shot this scene and one of the test audiences got to see it. Um, Rhett Reese explains it. He says he's got the crib. He's standing in a German nursery. He's leaning over the crib to do it. And then there was this kind of, oh. 
And we thought, we don't want to leave the crowd on an oh. So they ended up getting rid of the scene because killing a baby, even if it's a Hitler baby, <laughs> felt felt like it was a little bit of, of a rough territory for them to tread. Yeah, that kind of like brings into more serious territory. Uh, what, what was the other uh, end credit scene? The other one, uh, this was one that was only talked about. They never got to the point of discussing trying to make it happen or, or even shooting it. And apparently one of the ideas was that they wanted to have Chris Evans make some kind of appearance as Human Torch. So uh, they didn't even get to the point where they got to ask Chris Evans about it or anything like that. But apparently there was once a discussion about having Chris Evans appear in his, uh, his Fox Marvel role instead of his usual role that we've come to love him in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Captain America. That that could have been funny but confusing because I feel like no one remembers that movie even happened or those movies even happened. Um, Chris, uh, are, you, are you glad that these end credit scenes did not make the movie? Uh, I'm fine with the, the baby Hitler one not being in there because uh, it just sounds kind of stupid to me. I don't know, but the... Uh... The Chris Evans ones actually sounds kind of funny. I, I, I wish they had shot that. Yeah. I, I just wonder how many people would even remember that he was the Human Torch in Fantastic Four. Um, like, I barely remember it. Um, but uh, let's move on to some cameos, because there's a lot of cameos in this film. A lot, I mean, I actually didn't even notice them, to be honest with you. Uh, Chris, you compiled a list on the site uh, explaining the cameos. Uh, who was in this film that we might have missed? Uh, yeah, so th- there are some of these cameos that I definitely caught, and there's one big one which I definitely did not. So, uh, you know, once again, there's that running joke that whenever Deadpool is at the X Mansion, no one is around. And, you know, th- the first movie made that into like a budget issue that they couldn't afford all the actors. And in this one, he goes, he's going on that, that same sort of rant again. And he's saying, you know, uh, because it's so meta, he's saying, you know, we have more money now. We should be able to have more of the X-Men actors here. And then it cuts to reveal that uh, a, a good chunk of the X-Men cast, like James McAvoy and Evan Peters, and uh, they're all in the movie in costume and character in another room. And they sort of shut a door before he can see them. And uh, so okay, that was I, funny. I, that I, I want to clarify here. I obviously saw that one. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so the, that, that, that feels like it's the most obvious one. The second one, and this is another one that I caught. Is, actually, actually uh, before you move on, aren't those, yes. aren't those characters in like a different time at this point? <sighs> Who even knows anymore? Honestly, after <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't keep track of those X-Men movies. They Brad, keep... Brad, you're the superhero bits guys. Like, like, shouldn't they not exist in this timeline or this like age? Uh, not, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I don't, I, it's, I, I really don't know, uh, because it's, yeah, there, there's really, it's, the, the thing that makes it hard to tell is that mutants don't necessarily age the same way as humans do, so it's hard to tell, you know, how young they really are and that kind of thing, plus, Brad, I, appla- we, I applaud you, that, you, you, <laughs> you were able to pull it out of your butt, and, uh, as, co- as you know, the, the X-Men timeline is still, you know, crazy fucked and so confusing, so it's, who knows? <laughs> okay, Chris, you can go on, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> Okay. So the, the next cameo is um, there's one of the members of the X-Force is a character named Vanisher, who is literally just an invisible man. And uh, when that character, after the, you know, the big plane jump scene, cr- he crashes into some power lines and gets electrocuted. And while he's being electrocuted, we see who it is, and it's Brad Pitt. And uh, Brad Pitt actually has a connection to director David Leach. He was – David Leach was Brad – David Leach got his start working in stunts, and he was actually Brad Pitt's stunt man in uh, both Ocean's Eleven and Fight Club. So they have a, a friendship together. And David Leach just basically reached out to Brad Pitt and asked him if he wanted to do this quick cameo, and Brad Pitt – said yes and they shot it in about five minutes in front of a green screen on the on the fox lot so that's the second big cameo uh the third and this is the one i did not catch at all there's a um when cable travels back in time and ends up in the present he encounters these two redneck characters and um one of them is alan how do you say his name tudik is that right yeah tudik yeah so one of them is who played uh k2so 
Yes, and uh, he's rec- he's fairly recognizable, and he's also listed in the credits. But the other redneck guy is actually played by Matt Damon in a lot of prosthetic makeup, and he has like a fake beer belly. And I honestly didn't catch this at all. Like it, this, this actually legitimately surprised me when I read this today. And uh, so yeah, that that's that that for me is the biggest surprise cameo because he, actually... he's sorry. sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Chris. No, I was just gonna say he, for me he was unrecognizable. Yeah, I had no idea, and it's, and I was also distracted because I recognized Alan Tudyk, and immediately my brain went on a side thinking, I was like, wait a minute, is this a Tucker and Dale versus Evil cameo? <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, I didn't notice Matt Damon in, in, in the movie. I kind of wonder if like Matt Damon is now trying to make a career of uh, cameos in interesting big superhero films, because he did appear in Thor Ragnarok, uh, and now Deadpool 2. So uh, maybe Avengers 4 is next. I hope so. If, if Matt Damon only did cameos in movies like this for the rest of his career, I would be so happy to see that happen. Although I think it didn't um, the Russo brothers confirm that Matt Damon uh, character in Thor Ragnarok has been killed um, off screen. I think we reported on that. Anyways, uh, go on, Chris. I'm sorry. Uh, and this is this is the last one, and it, it's not it really a cameo, but it, it, um, I mentioned it for the sake of completion. Um, so uh, as we all know, or you know, if you saw the movie, you know by now that the Juggernaut is a character in the film, and that character is completely CGI. But it turns out that uh, Ryan Reynolds himself did the voice of the Juggernaut, and I didn't actually catch this either. I, I did, you know, I spent the whole film wondering who was doing that voice, but it turns out it was Ryan Reynolds. They they tweaked his voice a little bit in post. They you know they lowered the pitch, but that's him. One of my favorite jokes in the whole movie is when uh, Deadpool is like, "Cue uh, big CGI fight scene or whatever," but then it, it it gets into a big CGI fight scene that was like not interesting. I think it would have been cool if they could have uh, somehow uh, diverted expectations and done something more meta with that. Um, but maybe I don't know. So, some some of my favorite parts about the Deadpool series as a whole are kind of like those breaking the fourth wall moments. Um, but uh, l- let's talk about um, something that almost made the movie. Uh, we almost saw Dead uh, Deadpool become a father. Brad, can you talk about that? Yeah, this was something we actually found out about um, a little while uh, earlier before Deadpool 2 even hit theaters. And this wasn't even um, something that really made it into like a full draft of the movie. It was just when they st- were talking about what they wanted to do with the sequel and where it was going to go. They talked about the possibility of, well, what if we start the movie and Deadpool and uh, Vanessa already have a kid? And like uh, they thought about the idea of this being five years after the initial Deadpool, and they said like at, they barely got into trying to crack what that story would be like, and they couldn't ever figure out how to make it work. They kept trying to figure out, you know, if if it was even possible to, to make sense, even you know, work thematically, that kind of thing. And so eventually they just reworked it so that the the story and, um, and the, the the theme really, uh, as far as the relationship between. Ryan Reynolds um, and Marina Baccarin's character was more so about the idea of wanting a kid and Wade kind of coming to terms with like the responsibility and what that means and why he doesn't have to be worried about it. And that, you know, obviously ties into Russell's character and him helping him, you know, feel like he's not out of place and that he doesn't have to feel this constant pain after being, you know, abused by those, uh, the mutant, um, uh, purist people. And so, this was something that um, we don't see happen, but it sounds like maybe there's an interesting tie here that could lead to this the, a weird realization of a theory that's making the, the rounds online. Yeah, I wanted to, to bring this up to you guys. Um, this is something that I first saw published on Cinema Blend, and when I first saw it, I was like, that's ridiculous. This is stupid. And then the more I thought about it, the more I was like, wait. Maybe they are doing this. You know, I came across in the back end that that story about the baby. Um, Okay, so what the theory is, uh, is that um, Cable has been sent back in time, not just to, uh, you know, prevent Russell from doing the thing, but basically to to save uh, Wade, who will in turn save, uh, what's her name, Rachel? Is that the name of... Who are you talking or about? Or Vanessa, sorry. Vanessa. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, 
Okay, so like the, the movie kind of hints that there's like an extra connection between them. I think there's a line that basically uh, Cable says that he knows Deadpool in his future and he's not a a good guy or something like that. Am I correct there? Yeah, he says he's like, yeah, I know who you are. He's like, he's like, and, he's like, and you're no hero. Yeah, and then uh, C- Cable once he accomplishes his mission, uh, gives up his last, you know. Uh, plutonium charge or whatever you want to call it to go back in time uh, back to the future uh in order to uh help wade um so i'm wondering if there this is a setup could this be a setup for the potential reveal i mean cable is basically kind of played in this movie kind of like a terminator like character could, could this be a reveal left to a future movie that cable is actually married to Deadpool's daughter? Chris, is this theory stupid? I mean, you know, it's no more stupid than anything else that happens in the movie. I mean, I don't know what <laughs> this this seems like someone's just like cherry picking something out of the air and making it a theory, but if it turned out to be true, I wouldn't be like shocked just because it seems like they're literally making stuff up as they go along with this movie. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if they just throw that out there eventually. Brad, what are your thoughts? It definitely has some sound logic to it, and it makes some interesting sense. But that's also a pretty huge departure from the, you know, the comic books. Um, I mean, it's it's not as if the, the X Men movies haven't, you know, taken liberties with plenty of other characters and relationships and things like that. Um, but you know, I, I guess I just don't know what the point would be, except to just give them more that much more of a connection. Like, unless there's like really a more significant reason behind it. I'm not really sure that it matters. Well, here's the, also the question. Like, once you get to an X-Force movie, why isn't Cable, you know, going back to his future time? If they have, you know, the power to time travel, like, why is he... What is going to keep him there? Well, he did, he does say in Deadpool 2, he's like, I should probably stick around here and make sure that the world doesn't get any more fucked up than it already is or something like that. So, you know, that that is that kind of does become his task in the comics is to, like, keep time you know on track as far as like what it's supposed to do and stop shitty things from happening so Hmm. you know i mean i guess that could be it uh i I guess i'm not gonna argue for this theory because i'm not sure i believe it but i I could totally see it as being one of those things that the writers like kind of are setting up for a potential reveal and i I apologize ahead of time if this actually is a reveal in the movie um but it, it just seems like such a Stupid but fun theory. Uh, but we have reached the end of today's Slash Film Daily. Brad, where can people find more of your work online? Slashfilm.com is where I'm always posting words that people don't read. Uh, and you can also find me on Twitter at Ethan underscore Anderton. And my own podcast, Go Flicks Yourself, available on iTunes and other places that you download podcasts. Chris, where can people find more of your work? Uh, also slash home.com and I'm on Twitter at C evangelista 413. Uh, you can find me at slash home on Twitter, on Instagram, all those, uh, social sites. You can, uh, find all the articles we mentioned today on slash home.com and linked in the show notes. I'll also link, uh, we had one of our freelance writers, Jasmine, write a, uh, basically an explainer on X4. So if you are excited after coming out of Deadpool 2 and want to know more about X Force and what their potential is in this franchise, you know, you can find that article on the site and linked in the show notes. Uh, you can find this podcast published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Uh, please feel free to send us your questions, comments, concerns to peter at slash film.com. Rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word. We'll see you tomorrow.